You may be seated. As you are being seated, open your Bible to the last chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 24, as you're finding your way there. Can I just ask a question this morning? Is there anybody here that could use some hope? Is there anybody here feeling a little hopeless in the midst of all that's going on in 2020? Where does our hope come from? I don't know about you, I have learned my hope doesn't come from who governs us, my hope doesn't come from the nightly news, my hope doesn't come from medical technology or the economic environment. My hope comes from from the Lord. And I trust that is where your hope comes from too. If you've been participating here this morning, it may feel a little bit like Easter. And that's where we're going because we have finally reached the pinnacle of the gospel of Luke. The pinnacle of the entire Bible is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can you remember Easter 2020? Do you remember when you were told you couldn't come to church on Easter? on 2020, and that was awful. Well, this is the makeup for Easter 2020. And so I hope you are as excited about praising the risen Lord today as you have ever been. We have hope because of our risen Lord. Now, we need to understand something about this word hope. Christian hope is not like worldly hope. Christian hope is distinctly described in the Bible as living hope. Christian hope is living hope. It's not a dead hope. Everybody hopes in something, right? I remember being a little kid, night before Christmas, and I was hoping there would be some Christmas presents under the tree with my name on them. Um, Some of you are hoping that you can soon send your kids back to school. Any parents in the house ready to send the kids back to school? Any kids hoping, hoping school is canceled forever and you'll never have to go back to school? Anybody remember back to March when you would go to the store and you had hope that you would find at least one roll of toilet paper? Remember the hope that you had going in there and how hopeless you felt coming out? Well, listen, the... Hope is the universal condition of the human heart. Hope is the result of living in a fallen world. Hope is the heart's signal to the human mind that we were made to live in a better place. So even if you are an atheist this morning and you deny the existence of God, if you hope, that is an indication that you have a desire for this world to be better than it is. And that's what a general worldly hope is. It's just a general optimism that tomorrow is going to be better than today. That's, everybody has that. But Christian hope is different. Christian hope is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's described as a living hope because we have a living God who has come out of the grave in the person of Jesus Christ. We're gonna read about that here in just a minute, but I wanna show you a verse that's actually a commentary on what we're about to read. It's written by 1 Peter, Peter was the first to run to the grave. We're going to see that in just a minute. And Peter said this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see how hope results in an exclamation of worship? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because there's life. It's a living God that we have. He says, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If you don't believe that Jesus is alive, if you don't believe that God can make dead bodies live, then you are going to just kind of Be on your own to kind of have this vague anticipation that it might get better someday. 
I hope this virus will go away. I hope that we can all get back to work. I hope things can go back to be things can go back to being normal. Listen, if the pinnacle of your hope is that things can go back to being the way they were, you're not doing it right. Christian hope is not that things will get better. Christian hope is that God will make things perfect. You see, Christian hope is the future tense of faith. We talk a lot about faith in church, right? The Bible talks a lot about faith. By faith, we're justified. We're justified by faith. You can't be a Christian without faith. So what is faith? Faith is believing that what God has said he has done, he has done. It's reading a record of his Histor uh, historical record of what God has done and saying, I choose to believe that. And those are ancient truths in the past. You have to believe that God has done some stuff in the past. What is hope? Hope is the future tense of faith because hope says, I believe that what God has said he will do, he will do. I don't just believe that God's gonna make things better. I think God's gonna make things right. He's going to make them the way they were supposed to, believe, supposed to be in the first place. Christian hope is the confident expectation in God's promise to make things right. Everything my heart longs for will be made right in the new creation. And if you've not yet been born again, you don't have access into the future hope of what God has promised. I invite you to step in. If you want more than just a vague optimism and an anticipation that maybe things kind of going to get better, our Christian hope transcends all of that. Our hope is not that this world will get better. Our hope is that God will make this world new. He'll fix it all because he makes dead things live. Christian hope is what sustains us in the face of death and despair. Worldly hope essentially crumbles under the weight of death and disease and heartache and persecution and natural disasters and coronaviruses. Worldly hope can't sustain us through those times. But Christian hope transcends even the worst enemy. Do you know what the enemy of hope is? The enemy of hope is death. Right now, we are living in a world that is saturated with news about death. Turn on the news, what's the first thing they're going to tell you? They're going to tell you how many people died today, how many people are going to likely die tomorrow, and we are, we are saturated with news about death. So how do you have hope in the midst of of news about your impending death. By the way, you, you understand this, right? Even if tomorrow they announce there's a cure for the virus, you understand you've still got a problem. There are other viruses. There's things like heart disease and cancer and hypertension and, and stroke and Alzheimer's and diabetes. Because those things have been, you see the news was bad before the coronavirus, you just weren't paying attention. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, you're gonna die. Just, just, you're going to die. You just, you, I don't know what you're going to die of, but you're going to die. Just, aren't you glad you came to church today? You're going to die. Why are, why are you going to die? Because you live in a world that's broken and fallen. You have never lived in the world God designed you to live in. Because of sin and the curse, we are all going to die die of something. New did you see the new statistics this morning? They announced a new one. You probably have seen this yet in the news. Here it is. You want to write this down? One out of one people die. There's the statistic. That's the only statistic you need to know about. That's it. So my question to you is this. Do you have hope beyond the grave? Do you have any hope of surviving death? That's the Christian hope. 
And it's rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All Christian hope is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus. So we're going to take a look at it here this morning. And we're going to understand this. Our faith in our faith in Jesus, our faith that Jesus has risen, empowers us to live a life of worship and mission in between Jesus' death and resurrection and our death and resurrection. You understand that because Jesus was raised from the dead, you and I have the hope that we will be raised to life, eternal life. So the, the, the faith in Jesus' resurrection is how we can live in a broken world in between Jesus' resurrection and our impending death and resurrection. So we're going to finally get here to Luke. You remember last week, if you were here with us, Jesus is on the cross. Jesus dies. He commits his spirit into the hands of the father. Joseph of Arimathea takes him off the cross, wraps him in in linen cloths, places him in a tomb, and the stone is rolled in front of the tomb. And that's where we left off last week. Let's pick up the story in chapter 23, verse 49. And all his acquaintances... And the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Underline the word watching in verse 49. Now, how many of you had a mother that was really good at watching you? How many of you have discovered that, that women typically are very good at watching? Attention to detail. No things that you did, no things that you didn't do. I, I don't know, the women in my life are very good at watching. These women were good at that as well. Look down at verse 55. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb. Underline the word saw the tomb in verse 55. Luke, who's writing this, is trying to let us know there were some women paying attention to what was happening. And they saw how his body was laid. They, they, Luke is telling us, they noticed exactly how he was laid in the tomb. Verse 56. And then they returned and prepared spices and ointment. And on the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. So they were, they were in a time crunch here. Jesus died on Friday, right before sundown. He's placed in the tomb. And because of the laws of the Sabbath, you couldn't work on the Sabbath. You couldn't embalm a body on the Sabbath. You couldn't travel on the Sabbath. So the women, were, they ran out of time to be able to properly prepare Jesus for burial. So the time limit was up. They went home. They waited 24 hours. And they come back on Sunday morning. That's where we begin in chapter 24. On the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. Now let's just stop right there. Why did they go to the tomb on Easter Sunday? What was their motivation? Was it to praise the risen Lord? Was it because they were expecting to meet Jesus coming out of the tomb? Is that why they went? Do you know, do you know why these women went to the tomb? Because they thought, they thought he was still dead. In their minds, they had not yet believed that Jesus could be risen, that he could be alive. And so they are downcast. They are hopeless. The only reason they are going there is to prepare the body Back in the day, you, you embalmed bodies with spices and ointments. And so that's what they were going to the team, tomb to do. Now, one of the things that's great about the Gospel of Luke is he gives us so many details about women. There's 13 different occurrences, stories about women, the high calling of godly women. Thank God for godly women. How many of you are actually here at church this morning or watching online because of a godly watching woman. Because she's watching to see if you, you, you go to church. We're going to church. We're going to church, right? And, and so hey, anybody think, thankful for a godly mother that prayed, you, prayed for you when you were a knucklehead? 
or a godly grandmother that prayed you out of your wayward life back into a life that's God-honoring? Yes, Luke is constantly elevating the role of godly women, and that's exactly what happened here. It says they were watching. What had they observed? They had watched as Jesus died on the cross. They had watched as Jesus bowed his head and and breathed his last breath. They'd watched as Jesus committed his spirit into the hands of the Father. They'd watched as a soldier pierced his side and blood and water came out. They had watched as they saw his limp body taken off the cross and placed in a specific tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. And they had watched as as they wrapped him in those linen cloths, and exactly how they laid him in the tomb. What's Luke trying to tell us? They knew which tomb Jesus had been laid in. One of the things that we hear all the time is, well, they probably just went to the wrong tomb. No, they were watching. They had followed him. They knew exactly where he had been laid. And again, they are not coming to the tomb because they expect to see the resurrected Lord, they're just coming there because it was the first opportunity they could get to pay their last respects. They were not yet indwelt with a living hope. But something's about to change all of that. Verse 2, And they found the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. Now, Luke leaves out a lot of the details that we find in the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of of Matthew, the Gospel of John. And one of the things that we find out is while they were going, before they were going there in the middle of the night, there'd been a great earthquake and the stone had been rolled away. And there were these angels that showed up there that spooked off the Roman soldiers. Now, now can you imagine the women on the way, Mark actually tells us this, on the way, they're, they're having a conversation like, how are we going to get in the tomb if they put a big rock in front of it? We can't move the rock. They must have said, we'll figure that out when we get there. And the other detail that was in the way between them and Jesus were these, there, there, were, there was a big rock. There was a, there was a big man. There were big Roman soldiers guarding the tomb there. And they must have just had faith that somehow God was going to take care of those two obstacles. What they didn't know is that God had sent an earthquake and an angel, removed those two obstacles so that when they got there, they could go right into the tomb. And it tells us that when they did, verse 3, When they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. The stone had been rolled away. The men had been scared away. And there was an empty tomb. Now, if somehow in your thinking, as you generally read this, I used to think, well, of course the stone had been rolled away. So Jesus could get out. And then I started to read Jesus in other places in the Bible, like walk through walls. I'm like, okay, so he didn't, need, he didn't need the stone to be rolled away so he could get out. So why was the stone rolled away? The stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out. The stone was rolled away so that the women could get in. And they could see what God had done. It says in verse 4 that they were perplexed about all this. Now, perplexed is not hope. Some of you this week, you've experienced perplexed. Anything this week that caused you to be a little, you scratch your head like, why is this happening? I don't understand. God, why don't you do something about this? You ever been perplexed? Perplexed is the prerequisite for hope. So if you've ever been perplexed, hang on. God's about to do something. Next word. Middle of verse four. Behold. Now, again, behold is an important word. Behold is like, you're never going to believe this. It's like, just buckle your seatbelt. Behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their face to the ground. Frightened, the word frightened there is actually the word emphobia. It's where we get our word fear from. And this, it's like megaphobia. Emphatic phobia is what they were experiencing there. Because they were not just experiencing two men. They were experiencing two angels or messengers. In the Bible, the original word for angel is just messenger. So two messengers sent from God with a message. What was the message? He says, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? That's a great question. 
That's a, that's a question that I've had to ask this week. If I, as I've been studying this passage, I, I've just sensed the Spirit of God asking me, Hey, Trent, do you really believe Jesus is alive? Well, sure, I, I know that's the theological principle there. It's called the resurrection. I can, no, 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 no. Trent, if you really believed Jesus is alive, why are you so worried? Why are you so angry? Why are you trying to control everything and everyone around you? And the question that the Lord has asked me is this. Trent, are you living like Jesus isn't? Are you living like Jesus is still in the grave? Are you living in fear because you really haven't settled the truth in your heart that Jesus is alive. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's on the throne. He's in complete control. He uses all things, including viruses, for his purposes. So if you really believe like he's, he's, he's alive, your primary emotion would be hope, not anxiety, not anger, not fear. Are you living like Jesus isn't? That's what the angel asked. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? We're still going to dead places and living like dead people because we have something in our heart that's broken that thinks that somehow we have to play the role that the risen Lord has been sent to play in our lives. Why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. All right, now I know that caught you off guard a little bit there, but I, you have to understand, we have some rules here at church. When, we, when somebody from the platform up here says, he is risen, there's got to be an audible response from those here in the crowd and watching online. So would you like another run at that? Remember, this is supposed to be Easter 2020. This is the redo of Easter 2020. So if you do, if I do my job right, you do your job right, there should be confetti cannons go off somewhere in this room, all right? So I'm gonna give it another run at that. Are you ready for that? All right, here we go. He is risen! Okay, well, you're gonna to have to come back for Easter 2021 because we didn't love the cannons this morning, okay? So uh, it's something to hope for when you come back, all right? So he is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, verse seven, that the Son of Man must, underline the word must in verse seven, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. Jesus must be crucified crucified and he must on the third day rise all three of those things must happen in order for wicked sinful men like you and I to be saved and because it must happen it did happen according to God's plan so these angels announce the message from God now if you are someone like me who is skeptical about miracles that you read about that happened thousands of years ago, okay, if that's hard for you to believe, please understand the person who's writing this is a medical doctor. He's a man of science. He's not an idiot. He knows what he is writing is hard to believe. It's not just hard to believe, it is impossible to believe without God granting you the faith to believe what is otherwise unbelievable. But listen, he has not left you without hope. As a matter of fact, in order for you to walk out of here unbelieving what we are talking about, you will have to ignore at least six messengers from God. First of all, there is God himself who has by his grace and because of his love 
actually communicated to you. He's left where he was, he's come to where you are, he's learned your language, and he has communicated to you. He loves you, but there's a penalty and a price tag for sin. Jesus died for that penalty, and he is risen again. If you choose not to believe that, you're ignoring God as the messenger. But then secondly, he sent an angel so that we could get that message Luke wrote that down, which is the only reason we even know about that happening, because it was 2,000 years ago. So we're reading it in a book that God wrote. And then he communicates that um, through his Holy Spirit, illuminating the words on this page. And the angels are not creating a new message. They're just saying, remember what Jesus said. So there's the fifth messenger, Jesus. And then you got Pastor Trent that's screaming at you for about 40 minutes. You got to believe this. So in order for you not to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you'll have to ignore at least six messengers that are recorded for, here, for us here so that we could believe. Verse 8, and they remembered. This was the moment at which God, by His grace, activates faith in their heart, not just to remember something He said, but to believe that what He said was true. Verse 9 says, and returning from the tomb... They told, underline the word told in verse 9, they told, the women told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Verse 10 names who these women were. Mary Magdalene, by the way, Jesus cast seven demons out of her, so she, she, had, a, she had some baggage, don't you think? And so Jesus had resurrected her. And, and uh, then we have Joanna. And then we have another Mary. Mary was a popular name back then, apparently. So Mary, the mother of James. And of course, Jesus' mother, his, she, she was named Mary. And so verse 11 says um, that they told all these things to the apostles, but these words seemed to the men, the apostles, an idle tale, and they did not believe them. So I don't know what the men's problem were, but they were slow to believe. Let me tell you what the problem was. This is unbelievable stuff is what the problem is. And these women are reporting it to them as they've heard it from the angels. So now there's the seventh messengers to the apostles. Eventually, the apostles are going to believe. They're going to become the eighth messengers. They're going to write the rest of the Bible for us. And so you would have to disbelieve eight different messengers in order to walk out of here in unbelief. God has gone to so much trouble to convince us to show us, to deliver to us, to tell us the message that produces hope in our lives. They said, ah, it's a fairy tale. If you believe that, you're in good company because the first apostles, the first disciples thought it was a fairy tale too. Now, this is, the Luke, Luke is actually giving us credible evidence for why we should believe the Bible. Think about it. If you were trying to write a convincing novel or a convincing history book or something, would you include narratives that actually made you look bad? If the Bible is just written by a bunch of people that are trying to convince you of myths and fairy tales, would they have included the fact that they didn't even believe this in the beginning? No, the, the Bible is very honest. These were skeptics. They didn't believe that Jesus had risen from the dead because, after all, dead people don't live. But, verse 12, Peter. Remember Peter? He was an outstanding disciple, don't you think? The last time we read about Peter, he's denying he even knew Jesus. And he's weeping. But Peter rose. Get it? Jesus rose. And then Peter rose. There was a resurrection of faith that happened in Peter's heart. Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping. It's not a minor detail. They knew exactly which tomb it was. It was the one you had to crawl into. It was th that high. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. In other words, without a body. And he went home marveling at what had happened. My question to you is this. Have, have you moved from doubting to hoping to marveling? 
that what God has said he will do, he will do. One of the popular theories here is that somebody must have stole the body. Now, let's think about that. Who would have done that? Some people say, well, it was the Roman soldiers. No, you see, the Roman soldiers would have been killed if the body was missing, so they wouldn't have moved it. Some people say, well, it must have been the Jewish leaders, you know, the Pharisees, and they were always, you know, they hated Jesus, and so they must have stole the body. No, that would have been the exact opposite of what they wanted. They wanted to point to their dead body of Jesus. See all these people, you, you think he's alive? Look, we killed him, he's right there. Some people say, well, it must have been the apostles. The apostles, the, the ones that didn't believe that Jesus was alive. Some people say, well, it must have just been an anonymous grave robber. Okay, so the anonymous grave robber somehow moves the stone, beats up the Roman soldiers, goes to the trouble of unwrapping the linen cloths from the body and takes the body. If you're a grave robber, don't you think it would be a little easier and a little quicker just to take the body in the package? But they found the linens. The most probable exclamation of what happened is that God rose Jesus from the dead. And the claws were lying there because Jesus didn't need them anymore. My question to you is this. Are you living like Jesus isn't? I'll ask you the question the Holy Spirit's been asking me all week long. You see, here's the thing. You can believe the basic doctrines of the Bible. You can believe the Bible is true. You can believe that miracles happen. You can even affirm the tomb is empty. And on a day-to-day -day basis, you can still live like Jesus isn't. So my question to you is this. Do you believe in a way that changes your attitude and your life that Jesus is alive? Because... Because Jesus is alive, I can live with a living hope. I don't have to be angry. I don't have to fight. I don't have to worry. I don't have to fear because my living hope is telling me things aren't just going to get better. Things are one day going to be made perfect. Because Jesus is alive, I don't have to fear the penalty of death. You might ask, you know, last week we talked so much about the crucifixion of Christ. And we talked about how the crucifixion pays the penalty for sin. The cross saves. And I, I introduced to you all those fancy words. Remember those fancy words last week? Like substitution and propitiation and expiation and reconciliation and redemption. Listen, the only reason the cross saves is because the Savior lives a dead Savior can't save anybody. And there are lots of people this morning that will go to church and somehow there'll be this reenactment of the crucifixion of Jesus and, and having Jesus still on the cross and stuff. Listen, Jesus is no longer dead. Jesus is no longer on the cross because there's no reason for him to be there. The last thing he said was, it is finished. The price has been paid. That means this. I don't have to live like I have to contribute anything else to my salvation or my forgiveness. I don't have to perform for God. The penalty has been paid, and the proof that the penalty has been paid is that Jesus is no longer dead. God raised him from the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17 tells us, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you're still in your sins. And so because Jesus has been raised, all of those words that we introduced last week are all in effect. Because Jesus is alive, I can live victorious not only over the penalty of sin, but over the power of sin. Sin presents a twofold problem to us. Sin has a penalty that we cannot pay, and sin has a power that we can't overcome. You know what the power of sin is? It's death. You understand? Sin doesn't just make you bad. It makes you dead. It kills you physically and spiritually. So we need some resurrection power to make us alive both spiritually and physically. That's why Romans chapter 6, verse 23, 
says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, because Jesus is alive, I don't have to fear the power of sin. I don't have to fear the permanence of death. Death is the enemy of hope. If you've ever been to a funeral of a loved one, you know how hopeless you feel in the face of death. And yet, because of the resurrection of Jesus, I can know that there is resurrection life on the other side of the grave. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's a living hope that sustains me beyond the grave. On the cross, the power of sin killed my Savior. In the resurrection, the power of my Savior killed the power of my sin. You know what that means? You don't ever have to forfeit another fight against sin. Some of us get up in the morning and you, you say, I'm, I'm just a dirty, rotten sinner. That's what Pastor Trent tells me all the time. I'm just a dirty, rotten sinner. It's my identity and I'm just going to go be a dirty, rotten sinner today. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. You are a forgiven resurrected, dirty, rotten sinner who has all of the power you will ever need to overcome every temptation to sin. You don't tap out in the fight against sin. The power of Jesus' resurrection lives in you. You don't ever have to forfeit the fight against sin. That's what resurrection power gives you. And then finally, because Jesus is alive, I am a messenger of living hope. Do you remember all those different messengers we find in the story? God the Father, the angels, Luke who wrote it down, reminding us of the words of Jesus, the Holy Spirit illuminating those words to us, Pastor Trent, the women, the apostles, we're all inviting you to the party, to the movement. Think about it. You will move in a world in a very unique time in 2020 where everyone is saturated with thoughts of death. So just walk up to your neighbor this week and it's like, you're going to die. No, I just watched the news. It's, 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 you're going to die. I'm going to die. We're all going to die. So then what? Do you have a living hope? Do you understand the central message of Christianity is not you must do better. The central message of Christianity is you must be made alive. Not do good, but experience resurrection power so that when you die, you have eternal life on the other side of the grave. Really, how's that happen? Oh, let me tell you about it. There's this great verse over in Romans chapter 10. It says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, by the way, if you've never done that, that verse is not for somebody else. That verse is for you. Every word of that verse is so important. If, it's a conditional word. If, either you do it or you don't. If you, nobody can do this for you. Your mother can't do this for you. Your grandmother can't do this for you. All those godly women, they can't do it for you. If you confess, the word confess means agree. It's a word of faith. I agree with what God has said. And I'm confessing what God has already said is true. If you confess with your mouth, why is your mouth so important? Because that's the public declaration of what you believe in your heart. It's not enough just to believe some private things in your heart. If it doesn't ever make it to your mouth, we talk about what we believe. Have you noticed that people really like to talk about what they believe? Do you talk about 
the fact that you believe that God has raised Jesus from the dead. And that resurrection power is what you need to raise you from the dead when you die as well. If you've never done that, you've yet to be saved. Saved not only from the penalty of sin, saved not only from the power of sin, but saved from the wrath of God that was averted from us to Jesus on the cross and God raised him from the dead as a statement that the price for sin has been paid. That is what we must believe and that is our hope for future resurrection. Have you been saved? Have you ever gotten distracted by all of the religious noise and and the sacraments and the ceremonial parts? Listen, in order to be saved, you must confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, not just Savior, Lord, boss, putting my life under his authority, becoming a follower of his teaching. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. If you've never done that, you can do that right now. As a matter of fact, why don't we just all bow our heads for a moment. If you are not 100% confident that you have eternal life on the other side of your impending death, you need to be saved. How do you do that? Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that. At the end of this service, there's pastors and counselors and friends here at the front. All you have to do is come and use your mouth to confess Jesus is Lord. And that will be the indication that you have truly believed Jesus is Lord in your heart. And you can walk out of here with a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You might even want to open your heart to him right now and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on that cross to pay the penalty for my sin. And though it seems unbelievable, I choose to trust what you have said is true. I believe, Father God, you raised your son, Jesus, from the dead. Would you grant me eternal life as I place my faith in him? Father, I pray that you would give many here courage, to confess your Lordship. Would you grant faith to believe that you're a God that loves to breathe life into dead things. You resurrect dead marriages. You resurrect dead faith. Would you do that for many that are listening right now and pray that you would overcome the fear and the intimidation that I know that they're probably feeling just like I felt on the day that you saved me. Build that bridge. And Father, I pray that you would renew the living hope in each one of us. Our our hope is not in who governs us. Our hope is not in medical technology. Our hope is not in a strong economy. Our hope is in the living God that raises dead things and grants eternal life to all who will believe. God, would you send us out of here as messengers of hope to communicate that you are alive and because you are alive, we have no reason to be a hopeless people. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.